Are you back? Well, we may have had a bit of an interruption there. I'm not really sure how much we missed, but we'll just jump right back into the story, all right? So historically, right there at the corner, again, of Union and uh, Church Street, would have been the, the residence, the property of one Arndt Van Curler. And Arndt Van Curler, he was a pretty influential guy back in 1661. You can kind of think of him as the nominal founder of this little town of Schenectady. He was the, kind of the most charismatic and one of the wealthiest people living here, and he used that charisma and wealth to sort of serve as the de facto leader of a pretty ragtag group of settlers who were the first generation to come and build their, their homes here. Uh, but unfortunately for the, the people of Schenectady, uh, just a few years after uh, Schenectady was founded, Arndt Van Curler was traveling up north to uh, Montreal to resolve some tensions, some disputes between the, uh, the English here in, in Upper New York and the, the folks up in Canada. Well, along the way, he, uh, he drowned in a tragic accident on Lake Champlain and he was never seen again, lost to uh, history. Um, and his poor wife, his poor wife, a woman named Antonia Slackboom, well, she loses her husband, uh, but that's okay because she still has a, a pretty large, you know, property here in Schenectady. She has a large bowery or, or farm uh, that she can still, you know, uh, leverage. Uh, but unfortunately for her, after uh, her husband died, just a few years after that, well, her farm burned to the ground. And so she had no real way of, of making any kind of uh, living for herself, any kind of income. Uh, and so, well, she was a well-connected woman. She kind of knew what she was doing. She got a, a special permission, a special license from the governor to, well, sell liquor of all things. And of course, that was a very profitable, um, uh, profitable business back then. So she got that special license. She also got a special license to trade with the Iroquois, or the Native Americans, who would be coming to stop and stay at Schenectady. And so she actually gained quite a bit of uh, wealth and prestige doing that. And you can see that this this tough Dutch lady, uh, you know, she uh, she really didn't need a, a man in her life to kind of keep her going. And that was a, kind of an interesting thing about uh, Dutch society back then. Very independent women uh, for the uh, for the 17th century. They they kind of knew how to handle themselves one way or the other. But now I want to direct your attention to this lovely building over here. And actually, we might kind of just walk a little bit further along as we take a look at the Dutch Reformed Church. Well. Today they call it the First Reformed Church, but uh, if you're going back to 1661, of course, when the Dutch came here, they brought with them their Dutch religion, their, their Dutch Reformed faith, which was very important to them. It was kind of one of the few centralizing forces that would bring people together here in Schenectady at least once a week for the, those who decided to attend. Not, a, not everyone uh, attended, of course. Uh, but yes, the Dutch Reformed Church, um, not only did it serve Oh, let me, let me back up just a little bit. Uh, the first Dutch church was built, not here actually, but right at the intersection of uh, Church Street and State Street. That would have been way up there a little bit. And that was built in 1680. And it was interesting because even though uh, not all of the people living here were Dutch, they all just kind of assimilated into this, this congregation. In fact, one of the major sponsors for the Dutch church, uh, the first Dutch church that was built, uh, was none other than Alexander Lindsay Glenn, who was a, a Scottish man, right? Not a Dutch person, not kind of a, a native to the Dutch church. He actually probably would have been more Presbyterian inclined, but he put up a lot of money to have that Dutch church built. And that church, well, lasted from 1680 up until about 1690, when it was destroyed in an attack by the French and natives coming out of Canada, an event known as the Massacre, which we, we talked about that last week, and we'll, we'll probably talk about it a little bit more as we go through our tour today. That was the first church that was destroyed. They, they built another church, which uh, would have been right here in the exact middle of the intersection, making it only slightly less convenient to get around than it is today. No, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, but yes, it would have been right there in the middle of the town, but unfortunately that one burned in the fire of 1819. So you can see a uh, fire would be a continual threat uh, for these Dutch churches. In fact, as recently as 1950s this building right here also suffered a very serious fire it was built in 1862 uh, but it burned uh, in the 50s and they had to rebuild it basically from the inside out so whereas the interior walls do date to 1862 most of the the um the interior dates to uh, the, the late 1950s so fire always a perpetual threat out here and hopefully hopefully we never have to worry about losing the dutch church to fire ever again. So we're going to walk a little bit. We're going to walk and 
you know, you can take in the scenery. There's a, there's a lot to see here, a lot of very cool architecture. I can't talk about everything. I can't possibly fit all that information in my head, but you know, it's, sometimes it's just good to take in the sights and sounds. Now our next stop is going to be this, this white building right here. We're just going to go up a little bit further and check it out. All right. So when you're talking about historic architecture here in the stockade, uh, this is kind of like a, uh, an, an iconic house, an iconic structure, and it really gives you an idea of what most or all of the buildings would have looked like if you're going back to the 17th or to the 18th centuries. Uh, this is the, the Yates House, or in particular it's the Abraham Yates House. It was built probably in 1725. Uh, that's our, our best guess for it. Um, it's kind of hard to date those really, really old structures, but I do believe that is a, um, a, a pretty solid date there. But still, 1725. Uh, you can see it has a very classic, what we call a, a Dutch roof line, which is to say it's very steep and uh, it's kind of pitched towards the street, right? The, the gable is facing towards the street. Um, and that's going to be an important detail when you contrast that with English households, which have the gable facing parallel to the street. Um, other unique kind of architectural features here, as you can see in the front, they have brick. Brick was a relatively expensive building material in the 18th century, uh, and being expensive, well, the Dutch uh, typically would build uh, only the front walls, the facade would be made out of brick, it would be tied to a post and beam, a timber frame structure behind it, using these little tie rods here, like those kind of black tie rods there, which physically hold that brick wall onto the structure. If you didn't have those, that brick wall over time would lean and lean and lean, and eventually it would topple right here onto the street. So those are very, very important. Uh, you can see this house has been added onto many times over its, well, centuries in existence. Uh, you can see, first of all, we have an addition to the right-hand side, our right-hand side, uh, just a little bit of extra living space, but more importantly, perhaps, you can see in the back successive waves of expansion. You can see even just the, the building materials. Um, I can't tell you when each of these additions was put on. I don't know this house that well, but you can see at least three, four major expansions uh, being added onto this house, uh, continually adding back. And that's a very kind of common architectural trend that you see here in the stockade. Uh, these houses are built, you know, facing the street and then back and back and back. Uh, that's the way they're expanded upon. Uh, so when you think of Schenectady and its earliest form, again, think of, of this house. This Yates house is a classic example of that early Dutch architecture. And we can keep moving. So I'll just point out some cool sites along the way. For instance, across the street we have the 1836 courthouse. Uh, nowadays, I guess those are pretty fancy apartments. Uh, I wish I could live there. Those are pretty cool parts. Now this might be a little bit personal, but I live in I live in that building. So there you go. That's that's clearly where only cool people live. That's the Edison building. Uh, it's pretty good. If I got to break off my rent, I would say it's really good, but no, 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 that was, we're getting too in the weeds here. Parking enforcement by uh, my continual adversary living here in the stockade. It's, uh, that's a long story. We don't, we don't have time for that. But imagine this. Imagine, again, we're back in that earliest settlement of Schenectady 
there would have been a stockade right here, right? This would have been the end of, well, at least the, the fortified part of town. Everything beyond that would have been the suburbs, right? I mean, there would be buildings beyond the stockade wall. It just kind of happens that buildings are built, uh, you know, there's not enough room within the, the wall, so they build beyond. Um, now this, this road right here would have continued well into what would have been woods or, you know, pine forest, which you would be able to see from here, right? Nowadays, all of that is urban sprawl. But you really, you'd be able to see a very, very thick woodland uh, that would stretch between the town of Schenectady and the town of Albany. Um, so it'd be a much different site for sure. Now we're gonna head up this way a little bit and we've got some more things to see. Now this is uh, Ferry Street or North Ferry Street and this is one of my favorite spots just to come and take a look at all the really cool architecture that we have. We've got some cherry blossoms blooming. It's a really, really great time to be hanging out in the stockade today. Now our next stop is, is right up ahead. It's uh, one of my favorite buildings, I think, in the, in the entire stockade. I want to go for that, there's a landmine. All right, here we go. I want to call your attention to that lovely building over there, that church, uh, St. George's Church. Nowadays, they call it St. George's Episcopal Church, but uh, when it was built all the way back in 1762, they would have known it as the Anglican Church, right? The church for Anglicans or English folk. And that's actually very important, right? Because I, I mentioned at the beginning that this started as a Dutch town back in 1661, and it really took a, about 100 years for there to be enough English people coming to live in Schenectady that they needed their own church. And that's actually, it's a pretty good benchmark to, to gauge the, the number of English people coming to this little town is when did they have enough people to build a church? It's a, it's a, it's a rough benchmark, but it's, a, it's an important one nonetheless. Uh, so when this church was built in 1762, uh, well, I mean, Schenectady had changed quite a bit uh, with all these English people now living here. Uh, you're actually starting to get uh, a little bit of kind of th those tensions that would lead up to the Revolutionary War. And in fact, when the Revolutionary War did break out, uh, you know, people were divided on whether they should, you know, side with the Patriots or side with the Loyalists, right? Who's, who uh, was going to, to win the day here? And this area of town was very much known for being the kind of the Loyalist part of town. You know, if you, you had those kind of sympathies, you would hang out here because the Anglican Church, being the Church of England, was very much a, a proponent or a supporter of royal authority in the colonies. And as the revolution, you know, eventually the Patriots win. If you didn't know, the Patriots always seemed to win one way or the other. Um, as the Patriots uh, gained the upper hand, uh, these loyalists they knew that they had to kind of move on or, or leave. In fact, in the, the uh, aftermath of the Revolutionary War, uh, the Anglican Church in many cases had to rebrand itself as the Episcopalian Church to kind of you know, remove those ties to England. It wasn't really a very uh, um, uh, socially acceptable thing back in the day. And now, whereas this church is not the oldest in Schenectady, or that's to say the, the Dutch church, the Dutch congregation preceded it, this is at least the, the oldest building, church building, that uh, hasn't suffered from any unfortunate fires. So this really is a, a, re a really special building uh, to come and take a look at for yourself. One interesting little feature here is, and I don't know if you can see it, uh, we'll, we'll cross the street and try to take a look.
So uh, if you take a look right there in that corner, right there in that corner, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, you can see kind of a bricked in archway almost uh, right there in the corner. And you can see that, that that wing wouldn't have been there. That would have been an entrance, a side entrance. Now, who was using the side entrance? Well, when the church was first built, uh, the English allowed the Scottish, the Scottish Presbyterians, to worship here as well. How nice of them. But in typical English fashion, they're like, oh, you Scots, you can't use the front door like us English people. You guys got to use the side door. And so they were kind of forced to this little separate entrance. And it was kind of a very tense and awkward situation. Uh, but fortunately, not too much longer after that, the, the Scottish Presbyterians, they got their own beautiful church, which you can see back there. They, they built their own church, and they were, they were having fun out there. All right, we'll keep on moving. We've got to keep on moving. Hello. Would you like to look Well, maybe. You got, this is completely unscripted, guys. You guys want to take a quick look inside St. George's Church. Not always does this get to happen, but uh, we got lucky today. So if you guys don't know, we're doing a, a live stream for the Downtown oh, Connectivity Improvement Corporation. So uh, that's what's going on. You guys are now live to maybe a dozen people on Facebook. <laughs> so I am the dozen. rector of St. George's, Father Matt Schoenberg. Yeah, and he's great. He, he does this for us more often than you think. Whenever we're going by and he sees us, he invites us in. He's a really great guy. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm always eager to show it off. I'll turn on the light. So you can see a very beautiful structure. Now, I'm not sure what to say about the, the interior of the structure. Rector, would you have anything to, to add or say? Well, the, the way it looks now is pretty close to what it might have looked like when it was built. Mm -hmm. um, over time, they built these transepts mm. onto, the, onto the church. And um, in about the, the 1960s, early 60s, late 50s, there was a restoration here. Mm. And they built on that back chapel part okay. and kind of restored the church to its colonial style. Yeah. Well, they did a great job. I mean, it looks like the original. It really does. The, the architectural firm are the same folks that worked on Colonial Williamsburg. Ah, great. So they got the, the, the experts to make it authentic. Nice. And these are the original pews <laughs> with the doors. Oh, great. Do you know what? Uh, Bill William Johnson had a pew. Yes, he? he did. I imagine he's somewhere towards the front. Yeah, it, he is right over there, the, the, the second pew there on the second pillar. Wow. And uh, we actually we have someone working on a plaque that they're going to make up for that. Um, we have a, a, a historian from Johnstown that that's his, he likes to sit in William Johnson's pew. <laughs> so that's how I, I, I could see him there. I'm like, that's where William Johnson sat. Would that be um, uh, Scott William Johnson? No, no, um, Greg, Greg Thomas. Uh, I don't think I know Greg. Yeah. Well, that was great that we got to uh, yeah, go Yeah, absolutely, inside. anytime. Uh, thanks so much for, uh, for doing that. Oh, all right, that's not <laughs> <laughs> I need some Social toys. distancing, right? <laughs> so yeah, that's a, that's a very good illustration. Keep your social distancing, folks. So you never know what you're going to see or who you're going to run into when you're walking through the stockade, but that's a cool thing. Everyone here is pretty cool, so it just kind of works out that way. So I definitely want to bring us over there to that little uh, roundabout we have. Do you want to go to the cemetery? Oh, we can take a look at the cemetery. Real quick, we'll just take a look at that cemetery there. You can see that the English churchyard, the English cemetery, remained in its place. Uh, the Dutch had their own uh, cemetery that would have been up there on Green Street a little bit. Now all those graves got removed and I've always said to myself, I gotta look into why the English churchyard got to keep its cemetery but the, uh, the Dutch church did not. It's kind of an interesting question there.
Another famous stockade landmark is this statue right here, uh, known popularly as Lawrence the Indian. Um, and this is a pretty interesting little part of town, right? Again, historically, this would have been the northeast corner of town. There would have actually been, you know, kind of a, uh, a little fort or a little blockhouse right here uh, protecting that northeast corner of town. Uh, that's, of course, long gone. In 1705, they built a more substantial fort right there on that spot. Um, but even that, again, has well, long been, uh, been uh, taken down. Um, nowadays, you, you see this statue, and there's a bit of a story behind this statue. Um, now, after the massacre of 1690, right after the French came down and devastated the town, uh, Lawrence, he was a Mohawk man who was, well, he was pretty sympathetic to the plight of the Schenectadians. Uh, and all those uh, people who were taken captive back to Canada, about two dozen people in total taken back to Canada, uh, he decided he did his best to go up there and try to get those folks back. He led a party of Mohawk men up to Canada to try to secure the release of several of these prisoners of war. And he was successful in getting some of these people back. And kind of as a result, you know, he kind of uh, became a, a bit of a local legend. Now, I have to point out, though, that this statue is not really a statue of Lawrence. Even though it's called Lawrence, kind of in his memory, um, it was actually erected there in the 1870s. Uh, the statue actually came out of a catalog. It was just a generic Indian statue that would be sold to, of all people, tobacconists, tobacco stores, would have this Indian out front to just kind of sell their wares. Uh, and for whatever reason, the powers that be decided to put such a statue right here in the uh, in the, the, the roundabout. It wasn't until after the fact, much later, like 1970s, that this statue was kind of retroactively rechristened Lawrence the Indian. Uh, I don't know if that you know does justice to his memory or not. It's it's kind of an interesting question about whether that does a, a good job of kind of uh, uh, remembering the actual historical figure uh, who made a, his mark on Schenectady all those years ago. It, it's hard to say, but nonetheless, the statue itself is kind of, you know, it's, it's endeared itself to uh, everyone here. I'm not saying they should take it down or anything like that. It's just not necessarily what Lawrence himself would have looked like one way or the other. And I do believe, I, I heard the church bells just a little bit ago. I think we might be out of time. So unfortunately, uh, you know, that's the, all the time that we have here to, today. Again, there's, there's so much here in the stockade that I, I really wish that I could show you. Uh, I could be here talking your ear off for hours and hours and hours. But I'm going to let you guys go, and I'm going to thank you one more time uh, for, for watching and, and tuning in with us. And I'm also going to thank the Downtown Schenectady Improvement Corporation uh, for inviting us to, you know, take control of their page for a little bit. And uh, we hope to see you guys again in the not-too-distant future. Stay safe. Don't shake hands. Stay social distancing. Take care.